Hello, greetings from Washington DC and all around the world. We're here with the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center to have a conversation today about the future of both trust and sense-making online. We define sense-making as the act in which we ascribe meaning to our present based on both our past and current experiences. We define trust as the willingness to be vulnerable to the actions of others that we cannot directly control. These things matter because increasingly on an online world, we're interacting with people that we don't see. And in fact, we're interacting with things that aren't even people, whether they be bots or algorithms or AI. And so we're here with a distinguished group of panelists to have a very interesting conversation today about how can we actually address both the challenges and seize upon the opportunities with sense-making and trust online. We've actually had some events just yesterday even where actually we've seen a dramatic pivot where the UK announced that it is actually going to not trust Huawei devices within their country. That's just one example. We've seen other examples again where people are having to make choices about how they make sense of what's online and make trust decisions. I'm gonna turn first to our distinguished panelist, Mark Goodman, to ask him to give us his thoughts. Now, Mark is joining us uh, from an undisclosed location, so you're gonna sort of hear his thoughts, uh, even if you don't see him. But Mark, if you could uh, unmute yourself and give us your thoughts about what are both the greatest challenge with sense and trust making online, as well as the greatest opportunity. Thank you, David, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for having me here. I think it's a really interesting question, and it's very much a key question about all of our online transactions and all of our online interactions. Uh, in my book, I wrote about this phenomenon called In Screen We Trust. Uh, it used to be on U.S. currency we had in, in God We Trust. Now all of our faith is placed on screens. When your phone rings and you see a caller ID, oh, it's my mom or my boss calling. If you happen to be running a nuclear power plant in Iran and it says that all of your centrifuges are running uh, perfectly, then you will tend to believe that. And the problem in a world which is mediated through screens is that all screens are hackable. And so we find ourselves increasingly depending on an intermediate or a mediated world in which it's completely possible to change what is on our screen. So in effect, and many people know this from online dating or any other experience they may have had with screens, that what you see is not necessarily what you get. Um, and that's really becoming much, much more sophisticated as we go forward, as you mentioned uh, or alluded to, the overwhelming majority of online transactions today are bot to bot and thing to thing uh, through the internet of things, less so with people. Uh, these days. And when you take these interactions to scale and apply to them either artificial intelligence or machine learning, you can also create deception at scale. Sun Tzu famously said that all warfare is based upon deception. And so what we have created is a mediated world uh, where we're all living through screens and all subject to ever greater amounts of deception. And so to the central point that you're raising is how do we get to truth in this world? I think that is going to be the very key question about the society that we are building uh, for the future. Well said, Mark, and we're going to assume that you're not an audio deepfake, that this is really the true Mark Goodman and not the bot posing as Mark Goodman. Um, we can um, neither confirm nor deny that at this time. <laughs> That's where you're supposed to say that does not compute. Repeat your question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> I can't do that now. Yes, exactly. I'm now going to turn to uh, Ivana and ask you to both introduce yourself uh, and then talk about your thoughts about the biggest challenges. If you could unmute yourself and say the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity that we should be addressing in this space, Ivana, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I am the CEO of Omelas, which uses AI and machine learning to detect influence operations online. Um, I am also a non-resident senior fellow at the council uh, with the Scrollcraft Center for Strategy and Security. Um, and so the way that I actually approach this question is by using, I think of, of a two by two matrix, right? So on top, you sort of have the offline and the online, and then on the side, you have the trust of humans and trust of hardware. And what Mark talked a lot about is the trust of hardware, um, and all these things sort of bleed into each other. But if you think about, you know, this two by two matrix, you basically get four quadrant. The first is 
the online trust in humans. And this is what I really focus on, which is disinformation and misinformation. Um, since COVID has started, we have seen a huge increase um, in disinformation. And we have also seen more disturbingly a trend of using what I am going to coin as this disinformation as a service. So on the dark web, you can actually buy um, services for people. A lot of them actually come from the Russian Intel services or the Chinese uh, Intel services. Essentially, they have you know gone entrepreneurial and they started their own business where they say, hey, for $10,000, I'm going to write a fake story for you and I'm going to have it placed on Reuters, right? And for $10,000, it's a, it's a pretty good deal for a lot of people. Um, and so there's also, so there's obviously a lot of opportunities in that, but at the, at the same time, it's, you know, how do we actually trust the news that, um, that we're reading, right? How do we actually trust the stats behind the screen or are we going to go sort of the opposite direction and just only really trust, uh, the people around us and what they're saying. But as we all know, we all have that crazy uncle or crazy someone in our family who is so out of there. So how do you actually think about that? Very, very good said. And if I could ask you a follow up on that, Ivana, is in terms of you're sort of pulling the string on the news creation. Is this a case where there's actually bounties being set to actually encourage uh, events to be created that actually create the news too? So it's actually, do we even trust both what we hear that's happened, but then also then do we trust the interpretation? So interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, we have definitely seen, especially the Russians, and they started do doing this back in 2014, where they faked an ISIS attack on a chemical factory in, in uh, Louisiana. Um, and, it, and in fact, like it had that never happened, there was never a fire, there was never an attack, and yet it made the front news of CNN, the New York Times, everything. So there's definitely a huge um, push now to let's create these fake account, uh, or fake events that never happened, but at the same time, um, let's spin disinfo or fake news on things that have already happened. And so one good example is with COVID-19, everyone's looking for a cure. And we've seen a lot of disinfo around plasma, right? And people are actually selling plasma as a cure on the, on the dark web for a lot of money. Wow. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. And I appreciate it. I'm now going to turn to another uh, guest that is joining us in this case by phone. Um, Barbara George, um, seems like both Mark and Barbara are making sure their biometrics are not spread to the internet today. Uh, Barbara, are you there with us? And would be interested in your thoughts about both what's the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity when it comes to sense making and trust online? Yes, I did make it, although I had uh, some technical difficulties with the um, video, which doesn't endear me to trusting the system very much. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I am the executive director of a nonprofit called Washington Cyber Roundtable. Um, we uh, have had a little bit of an issue with the, the COVID situation because we tend to uh, do face-to-face -face meetings, so we've been kind of on a hiatus. My day job is um, a cybersecurity strategy and policy analyst with um, uh, industry and working with the government. But I, I kind of wanted to go in a different direction because I, I think you talked about trust um, being linked to giving up control. And so my human factors background is not necessarily highlighted in, in my LinkedIn pro, um, profile, but fundamentally um, the framework that I use is called perceptual control theory. And it's been around for 60 to 70 years, and it's based in uh, control systems engineering and cybernetics. And it talks about how living systems function. So in essence, what, what I'm thinking is behavior is control of perception. How you view the digital world governs your actions. So to answer the question, I think that, that the biggest challenge or opportunity is use of critical thinking. People tend not to, to go to the second and third level um, and consider consequences. You can't blindly assume that you're safe and expect someone else or some other system to protect you uh, while you're online. And so um, I just, I feel like, and I think that this runs across um, 
many of the situations that we're faced with today in in politics and with the virus and such, we just don't think about the what if. Very, very, very helpful. Maybe if I could pull a thread a little bit more on that you're saying that, that yeah, maybe what we need to make sure is we don't do blind trust, um, but we do sort of, we think about the what ifs and what if this is being something that's being uh, released, uh, as Ivana said, to to either trigger my emotions or to to, to inflame or create misinformation. So um, maybe if you could give us maybe one or two additional sort of concrete examples of scenarios in which people really should be thinking deeply, more deeply about what am I being presented with, um, and why is it maybe trying to trigger some some emotions or behaviors? Um, yeah, so I think that um, what we're talking about is is power and control, mm -hmm. and um, people have a choice to you know give give up their power and control, and so um, and eventually, I mean, we'll we'll get to this, but but. Typically speaking, the only way that that you can change your behavior is through influence, coercion, or force. Okay. So by influence, I'm talking about uh, things like education and training. That would influence you to better cyber hygiene. Coercion, for example, would be something along the lines of um, there's a breach and all of a sudden your, your personal data is out there for everybody to see. And then you have to reassess and decide oh, maybe I need to take a look at my cyber hygiene. Force, I think um, a good example would be your system admin in that, for example, my laptop does not let me access Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that because the perception of, of being forced to be protected matches my understanding of, okay, if I don't accept it, then I don't have a job. <laughs> so that that's that's a really good example of the different levels in which behavior change can happen. So um, mm -hmm. so with so with that, Don, I'm going to turn to Don Codling, who's also joining us. Uh, Don, you you've had a, a, a deep experience with the FBI and, and also in the private sector, and you've seen uh, bad actors of all types and, and had to address it. What do you think as you look at this world we're going into and, and, and the challenges of both cyber, um, but also in terms of trust and, and what we were talking about misinformation, disinformation, and how it might be trying to change people's behaviors? What do you see as the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity here? I'm going to build on some of what uh, Ivana and Mark started to talk about. And also, not, not that people have to be reminded, but I think it's always interesting to bring things into context. Since money was invented, one of the very first groups of people that society and governments had to deal with were counterfeiters. Hmm. Somebody figured out, if I can fake this, um, fake it to make it, right? Uh, that was also one of the reasons throughout history that the penalty for counterfeiting was death, because hmm. you made the king look bad and you made society not trust the money, right? if that got to a certain point. So I think that's that's always going to be a challenge when you're dealing with human beings and any system, to Mark's point, be it a technological system or to Ivana's point, people's perceptions, that there will always be some people who are bad actors who are going to try to game that. That doesn't mean you should build society only around trying to defend against that, but that has to be really, really an important part. So something I think that would be if that's on the challenge side, maybe something that will help society get to a better place is maybe along the models of underwriter labs here in North America or, or consumer reports here in North America, where there's an independent body who is largely trusted across the board, does not have a financial profit motive, does not have a political motive, and just says, we're going to look at things, whatever those things are, and we're going to try to make an educated judgment of does this thing do what it says it does? Can we build something like that? Is that a quasi uh, government public private partnership to make that happen? But I think that will be a huge help to solving some of the problems and to help uh, even Ivana's points about disinformation. If people can agree that this particular group is relatively um, neutral, shall we say, mm -hmm. and can be trusted, I think people will find that useful. 
people will find that comforting in some cases. Excellent. And, and thank you, Don. And, and I'm now going to circle to Ivana because I saw she had a, a, a question, I think, for Barbara. So Ivana, uh, you had a question? I did. Um, I was really interested uh, once you started talk, talk, talking about trust and command um, and specifically around how do you feel um, or what's your opinion on how social engineering, both as a privately done um, you know, service or as like a government specific nudges, if we want to call it that. So Chris uh, Richard Thaler um, wrote the book Nudge, and then that was implemented here in the US as well as in the UK, the Nudge unit. Um, do you think that actually decreases or increases people's trust? You know, it's it's hard to say because of the fact that that people's perception is their reality and so based on you know your experience whether you're what they used to call the the digital native or digital immigrant um, that is going to to pretty much um, outline how how you behave and, and how much trust you have um, so it's I, I can't say anything further than that well, and maybe to build on what 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 Ivana asked, and what Barbara said, and and I'd be interested in both Don and Mark's thoughts. Um, I think it was a classic movie uh, called Sneakers uh, that in which uh, there's a conversation with Cosmo that said, you know, uh, that they learned that uh, what matters more is not reality but the perception of reality, uh, and that with banks, it's not whether or not the bank is actually liquid or not, but if people think a bank is illiquid, then they'll make a run on the bank. And by making a run on the bank, that effectively does make it a liquid. So, so Don and Mark, it sounds like Mark, if you have a thought, and then I'll go to Don. Go ahead, Mark. David, that quote that you were referencing from Sneakers is one that I talk about all, of, all the time. And what he says is, the world isn't run by weapons anymore, or energy, or money. It's run by ones and zeros, little bits of data. It's all electrons. There's a war out there, a world war. It's not about who has the most bullets, it's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we work, what we think, it's all about information. And I think that is perfectly accurate. Uh, if we can control the information or even the perception of information, then we have won the war. And I'm sure that Ivana sees that very clearly in her work and I was particularly, um, uh, pleased to hear the comments of Dr. George talking about sort of critical thinking and critical analysis because anybody who's got kids in a public school today, uh, particularly in the United States, will notice that critical thinking is being thrown out the door. We're using a lot of terminology to say, well, spelling is more subjective and math is actually subjective. And, you know, physics really, if you want to do it a different way, you can do it uh, because, you know, we all have our perception of what's right and wrong. And so this, you know, we're just going to throw Newton's laws of physics out because you have a different perception. And I think that lack of critical thinking grounded in science and STEM is really going to come back to bite us in some really, really significant ways. So I have deep concerns for that. And uh, I think that w as long as we continue to have our life uh, and world uh, intermediated by computers and screens, we're going to be subjected to this. And I don't think that people fully understand that. And just to go uh, potentially crazy and conspiratorial here for a moment, if one wanted to go ahead and take over the world, right? Then look at the world we have today and that would how it would be potentially how you would go about it, right? You would see distrust in the media, you would see distrust in politics, you would see distrust in large international organizations, the European Union, the UK would leave, et cetera, et cetera. So you would so distrust everywhere and things like science and math that were previously taken as sort of like the paragons of reasoning are now being called into question. And add to that, the fact that all of this is being done in virtualized or technologically intermediated environments, it allows you to exert that control at both an exponential pace and an exponential expanse, which is really why we've seen it take off to the levels that it has. 
Well, well said, and and I think uh, to sort of expand upon your your theory, recognizing we we don't we don't necessarily know if this is happening, but I think you would also take out those that are nonpartisan or neutral, so you remove the ability for societies to work together. You take out the bridge builders across sectors and across uh, public, and you might even then, uh, you know, you have this perfect storm of uh, a virus that forces everyone to be mediated by screens, and uh, that's that's not a good world to be in. So so Don. Uh, how do we how do we sort of move forward and how do we fix this? How do we how do we do your model of possibly an underwriter's lab or some some other types of institutions amidst a world that is increasingly distrustful and people are applying different interpretations uh, on what they they subjectively value? Well, David, to go to uh, some of Mark's comments and to add on to yours right now, if uh, if all of us have ever been on a freshly paved road where there are no more line markers because they haven't painted them yet. Um, you can tell even when everybody is driving correctly, there's a little bit of chaos thrown in there because people don't know where their lanes are. If you want to make it really entertaining, uh, as Mark would suggest, let's remove the guardrails as well mm -hmm. on a mountainous twisty road with no lane markers and watch what happens, right? So I think one of the real key roles of governments and civil society, if you will, is to make sure that there are some agreed lane markers and that there are some guardrails put up. And in a perfect world, I would want those lane markers carved into the pavement so they could not be easily erased. And I would want the guardrails to be super, super strong and very evident. So in other words, here's the road, you are going to stay in this kind of path Yes, you can have be free spirited and you can think about maybe changing lanes correctly, but you're not going to go off the cliff. <laughs> uh, at least that's the hope. And maybe more importantly, you don't want to force anybody else off the cliff. And sadly, I think uh, to Ivana's point, that's what some of these disinformation campaigns are specifically designed to do is to take a group of people and put them through the guardrail off the side of the cliff. Uh, but I don't well, want to speak for you, Ivana, but that, that's kind of where I yeah. hear things could be headed with certain groups. Ivana, yeah, do you sure. have a quick rejoinder? Yeah, ahead. I do, actually. Um, I really like the paradigm shift that Don just mentioned because before, when we're talking about now, we're seeing this increase in distrust in the media and the government. That's because our paradigm has always been the default is that we trust the government because of some kind of a social contract or something like that, and we trust the media, right? Um, and the default is that we always have that something, but now that with the internet, it's almost like we're shifting to there is absolutely nothing, and we want things to be built on top of it. And now that's really hard for people to wrap their minds around because you're almost saying, hey, here's unlimited freedom, but now we're going to limit that and oh, by the way, we haven't signed a social contract because there's no, there's nothing like, you know, a nation or a country like that. Like none of the old ways of thinking about how do we actually like group together as civil society or as a nation, as the EU, right? Any sort of intergovernmental bodies, like that doesn't exist. So how can we actually create something and put these guardrails in place without pissing people off? <laughs> Well said, and I was having a flashback when both you spoke and Don spoke. Um, there was a time about 11 years, 10, 11 years ago in Afghanistan, when we would go on some of those dirt roads, and quite frankly, it was sheer force of will that determined whether the traffic was going one way or the other. It wasn't, there was no guardrails, and, and quite frankly, I'm surprised there weren't more car accidents. But maybe we've discovered that with the information superhighway, uh, it has no lane markings at the moment, and we're surprised. So, so I'm going to now sort of take that, 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 that scene setting we've done and, and maybe dig a little bit deeper because Don, you were talking about, you know, sort of uh, what we could do about actions to address this. Uh, and, and I know, Ivana, you gave the idea of thinking about humans, also thinking about hardware. Uh, Don, real quick, could you talk a little bit about has software made things even more complicated because it's no longer just about verifying that motherboard or verifying that that hardware device you think is doing what you want it to do. But then there's software updates, and software is very tricky. Could you talk a little bit about that? And then, uh, Barbara, I would like your thoughts on that as well on the software side. Well, the soft underbelly of, of any system is going to be, there's a couple of soft places, but probably the one a, a dedicated or motivated attacker is going to go after first is the software. 
because the software drives everything or most everything that's going to happen to that piece of hardware. And that can be a router switch. It can be a border gateway protocol device. That can be the routers that all of us are using for our Wi-Fi. That is going to be the logical place for an attacker to try and come in and, and make a uh, make not just an entry, but make some some edits and make some changes and drop a payload inside of there, right? So what do you do to defend that? You run validation and verification tools against that software. You basically whitelist the software that you put on critical devices. And you want to make darn sure that the people who are, and this goes back to what Ivana was mentioning, the people who are touching that software, who are allowed to really get in at a, at a root user level, are trusted and that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, does that mean that an attacker, uh, an adversary, either deliberately, maliciously, or inadvertently can screw things up? Yes, absolutely. That's where you get into redundancy and resiliency and make sure that you've got some sort of a backup, some sort of a trusted base or, bit or platform to pivot off of. Excellent. Thank you, Don. And Barbara, would would be interested in your thoughts too about how do we deal with this world of increasing software complexity? We've had the examples of uh, most recently with C data, where it looks like there there are some back doors that came with the appliances that people could get into the software side. Um, be interested in your thoughts about how do we address that, those challenges when it comes to the digital online world? Well, I think Don said it best, and and I just would just say, hey, what he said. Um, I I do think though that that we need to um, to support the types of, of regulations that come out, like the, the CMMC. Mm -hmm. I know that back in uh, the end of 2016 in the, at the Washington Cyber Roundtable, we were telling pe people, hey, this thing is coming. You know, prepare your, your organization, start your assessment, take a look at the controls, find out where you are, what you need to do, if you want to have government contracts. And it's taken a while and it's, you know, now out there and people are, are you know, having to deal with it. But um, it's just a, a very important um, aspect to step back and say, you know, look at the whole, the whole of what's going on and say, you know, what's in it for me? How am I going to come out on top of this? Thank you. That, that, and again, I think that's that's good to sort of go to the balcony. So not just look at the dance movements on the dance floor, but go up to the balcony and say, what's the longer term strategy that I want to do? Um, Ivana and then Mark, I'm going to ask a slightly different question, which is... Um, David, yeah, sorry, if I may, can I just chime in on that last uh, of point? Of course, jump right in. So uh, talking about hacking software is perfectly logical and reasonable, but I want to talk about two other uh, hacking vectors, one being hardware, which you mentioned briefly, and the other one being what I believe Ivana referred to as social engineering. Um, any good hacker knows the easiest thing to hack is the human, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why phishing emails are so successful, and of course, targeted phishing emails even more so. So we have done a terrible job, and, and Barbara was talking about the sort of three systems of control around the internet or, or devices earlier, that lack of critical thinking around um, the email message that you see or the text message that you see or the uh, Facebook message that you see is really quite, quite problematic and is a massive vector towards any attack. If you look at a study done by IBM Security just a few years ago, they studied billions of data breaches around the world. And they were able to trace 95% of all data breaches back to human error. So mm -hmm. I agree with everything that Don said about software and validation and a UL for you know IoT devices and a CE in Europe. That all makes perfect sense. But I think we've got a really long way to go on the human factor, human vector point. Uh, and I just also wanted to talk about hardware. Uh, you made a comment earlier about uh, at the opening of our dialogue about the recent flip-flop in the UK about their position on Huawei. And I just want to talk for a moment about what is uniquely 
different about hacking hardware uh, compared to software because much hardware is hard coded, right? And once it goes someplace, it can't change. You possibly can do some firmware updates on a lot of things you can't do firmware updates. So because we, uh, I believe all of our speakers in the United States, I'll use this as an example, but the same would be true in Europe as well. When all of the devices in our home have hardware in them, chips in them that are all manufactured in China, we have a risk. Right. I'm not saying that China has done anything untoward, uh, but I'm also saying that they haven't. <laughs> I'm not saying that they haven't either. Uh, and so the point is, we just don't know. Right. I mean, you need to be an electrical engineer and go through each little bit of what's on that uh, hardware board to understand what's happening. And that's nigh impossible. And so what we have is a massive supply chain risk. And just to look at what's going on on the supply chain side of things, that's not just with computer devices, we have that with medicine, right? We're having all of these medicines flown in from around the world, particularly a lot of it coming from China. So we have created a real supply chain national security risk in our country around that. If you look at the PPE protective equipment, right, we're getting massive and massive amounts of stuff from China that is labeled N95 mask, which is in no way an N95 mask, right? And we see Customs and Border Protection seizing these devices. So I think that understanding hardware and infrastructure and the risk that it poses, I do a lot of work in the medical field. And if you look at the number of implantable medical devices out there. I've been talking for decades about their hackability and how vulnerable they are. And if you can imagine, you know, there are several millions of implantable medical devices that are put in patients in the United States every year. If you realize that one of those um, you know, cochlear implants or diabetic pumps or um, uh, internal pacemakers has a vulnerability. The way you fix that is you have to do brain surgery or open heart chest surgery to remove those. So if any one of those had a zero day in it, you can kill three to five million people by flipping a switch. So uh, software, yes, but human factors and hardware as well. Very good segue. In fact, you were going exactly where I was going to go um, in terms of talking about the wetware. Uh, and I actually wanted to circle to Ivana because, you know, we talked about the vulnerabilities in software, but I think we need to, to recognize that, that maybe we humans are the, are the biggest challenge because uh, uh, our wetware uh, can be manipulated, as, as Barbara was talking about, in terms of information inputs and, and, and attempts at behavior change of some sort. So, so maybe what is your solution that, you know, I mean, closed societies, you can set the narrative, and if people don't like it, you either imprison them or kill them. Um, what can we do for more open societies in which we want to have freedom of speech, we want to allow multiple narratives, but we also need to recognize that, that there may be um, very intentional attempts to do social engineering um, that, that will cause increasing divides in open society. So interested in your thoughts, Ivana. Yeah, and so before I answer that question, I actually want to respond to something that Mark sure. said around 5G. Because 5G is interesting, right? Because it is a hardware problem, but, um, and we always talk about 5G as in, hey, China can actually, you know, hack or um, force Huawei employees to give them access, et cetera. Um, but I mean, quite honestly, as Snowden has revealed, um, we've also done that with fiber optics cables going from tech giants as well. Um, but so for me, it's not so much about the hardware being hacked when it comes to 5G, it's much more about the social aspect of why do we tr trust the US, we're a democracy, and we don't trust an authoritarian regime like China. And that's what, because we know for a fact that they're going to use it for bad if they haven't done that already. Right. Whereas for the US, we have due process, we have all these things that have to uh, first get approved in order for law enforcement or the government to get their hands on something like that. So I actually think when it comes to 5G that there's a lot more social trust than hardware. Mm -hmm. And then to answer your question, David, um, I mean, if I knew the answer to that, like, <laughs> I'd be rich right now. Um, I actually, so it's a really, really fine line for people to, for especially social media companies to draw. And I'm all for, I, I'm all for freedom of expression and all, all of that online. But I do think that once it starts to, we take, you know, the classic Supreme Court case of 
once it starts to harm someone else in society, then that's where we sort of draw the line. But how that manifests, like, and I don't want to say like, you know, I know it when I see it kind of a litmus test, but at the same time, that's where we are right now is we all know that there are certain conspiracy theories, especially that are harmful to other people that, for example, have caused people in India uh, to be murdered, right? Uh, because of a WhatsApp disinformation campaign. Um, and so in that case, that's definitely not okay. Um, but there are also, and you know, I've been tracking Al Qaeda and neo Nazis online for almost 10 years and looking and knowing how sophisticated they are in walking that line of, I want to spread my hateful ideology, but never crossing over to the violence aspect of it. Um, and they've only gotten better. And so, the question I have in my mind right now that I'm struggling with is, do we actually want government regulations on that? And if so, how would that actually look like? And maybe the government is not the right uh, actor to put those regulations in place and rather it should be the platforms themselves. Could it be the platforms or let me ask you, and again, we're, and then if we had all the answers, we probably would, uh, we wouldn't even be trying to solve these issues. These are hard <laughs> challenges, so not to put you on yeah. the spot. Could it be the platforms or could it even be a nonprofit or collection of nonprofits maybe involving citizen juries where, you know, I mean, not that people in the United States love doing either uh, paying taxes or doing jury service, but maybe one of the things that we need to say as part of the civil society is congratulations, you got a letter that says for the next six to nine months, you're going to be part of a citizen jury that will actually mm -hmm. help with doing this deliberation and then you'll rotate out. So, but interested in your thoughts on that as the way we could actually make sure it's done with people as opposed to two people. Yeah, I like that idea, but I'm not totally in love with using citizens because it's going to be the same problem that we have with juries right now as they tend to skew one demographic over another, right? Yeah, and we how have do to you make have sure that representation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain yeah. voices that are not heard, yes. <laughs> but I, I, I do take your point to, for example, how ICANN at the UN, um, you know, they're in charge of uh, the DNS system. Right. Um, so maybe something like that, where it's a lot more global, um, but then you kind of run into issues with authoritarian regimes and having different, you know, is is the PKK actually a terrorist group? Um, well, it depends on who you ask. So Interesting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so now I'm going to sort of go sort of circle to the panelists and say, uh, we, we, we've, we, we've touched on a lot of these challenges. Uh, we now see with, again, with 5G that the UK has done a shift. Um, if you were to be either president or prime minister or UN secretary general for the day, uh, what would you do to tackle these issues? And, and I know those, that's sort of hard questions. I'm going to go first to Barbara, and then to Don, and then to uh, Mark and to Ivana. But um, you, you get you get two to three minutes to sort of say you are you are a world leader with with the ability to influence and what may happen. What would you, in a perfect world, try to do to actually shape a more positive future in terms of the agenda? Uh, and Barbara, interested in your thoughts. Well, um, I think it boils down to ethics and morals. Um, when I was counseling years ago, I would tell, especially when I'm dealing with teenage boys, you can do anything that you want to do, except you can't hurt yourself, you can't hurt others, you can't do damage to property. Mm -hmm. And by hurting, uh, you know, I'm talking about spiritually, mentally, physically, you know, emotionally. And and I would kind of say, hey, you know, if you can come up with something that, that fits that criteria and you can get away with it, you need to let me know. And you you can't. I mean, it's been years and years. You just, there isn't anything that, that allows you to do that. So if we had, you know, this moral compass, um, which is is a tough thing because of all the different uh, cultures that we're dealing with worldwide. Uh, the only thing I could, I mean, internationally, we have to, to come up with a set of, of standards and, and have people agree to them. The problem with that is, and, you know, Ivana was talking about, you know, terrorism. In the perceptual control theory um, concept, I used to think a lot about, well, how do we deal with terrorism? And, and it is that you, if someone so firmly is ingrained in an ideology, 
you cannot change their perception. Hmm. They're not willing to change that perception. So then you have to figure out a different way, a way to deal with it. Um, I do know that, that one of the things that we do in, in, for example, marketing is that you on the spectrum, when you have a new product and you're trying to get people to buy, you go to the folks who are like-minded, who would say, oh, yeah, that's something that, that I can use and I would be happy to buy that. And then you go to the next segment, which would be, I've never heard of it, but, you know, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, that might work. And at the other end of that spectrum are the ones who say, heck no, I'm you know, not interested and I would never, never buy that product. And unfortunately, humans have a tendency to go after that group that, doesn't want to buy the product and try to uh, influence them to say, hey, you know, yeah, you really could use this product. So we're wasting our time going after a group who's pretty much has their mind made up. So we should be focusing on on the the communities or the cultures that are are more closely associated with the types of 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 ethics and morals that that we as the U.S. view. I like what you said. Anyway, that's what I think. Uh, no, no, that was very insightful, Barbara. And, I, and like you said, don't focus your energy on the laggards, so those that you'll never be able to bring along. Focus on those that are both early adopters and, and the middle. Uh, and what I also exactly. like about what you were saying is, is we do need to recognize that it boils down to what a very uh, sage and wise philosopher by the name of Arisa Franklin said, which is uh, it's all about R-E-S-P-E-C-T. It's all about respect. Uh, and so mm -hmm. if we can figure out people that have respect and they're willing to actually say, I respect you enough that I will not try to harm you mentally, psychologically, spiritually, physically, and everything like that. Those are where we should focus, but then it also gets to Don's point, and, and I'm gonna to go to Don next. Um, there may be some people that unfortunately, science has shown, uh, between one to 2% of the world are psychopaths, uh, meaning they don't have the same emotional response to hurting another person that you and I might have. And so there may be other actions that are there. Um, but Don, I know you've had to deal with challenging issues with this as well. So if you were prime minister, secretary general, president for the day, what would you recommend? So I want to throw an idea out, out to my fellow panelists. Let's say, and this, this is going to go to, to something Mark said, something Barbara just said, and something Ivana has said. How about we do this? We pick a group of scientists. Yes. We may have just lost Don right when he was getting to the point. Oh, Don, we may. Let's see. I'm going to see. Why... Oh, now you're back. Are you back, Don? Yeah. OK. Yeah, there we go. You're just getting to the punch. How's that? So when the, when, the, when the, uh, the ghost in the machine decided to, to uh, interfere. But you're here. So go ahead, Don. OK, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go just on to uh, audio and see how this okay. Sounds good. Right. So, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So this will be very, very simple. Um, here's the idea: you throw, let's take, uh, go to the United Nations. You throw everybody into a bowl with the name of their country. You pull out ten of those countries. I want a group of ten scientists and engineers from each one of those countries to come up in like. Hmm. We'll circle back to Don. Sorry, Don. It looks like there may be a, uh, the, the ghost in the machine may be uh, uh, throttling your bandwidth. So apologies for that. But we're going to go to Ivana. And Ivana, your president, prime minister, secretary general for the day, what would you do? Um, I would spend a lot more time and effort and in programming into education. So both critical thinking that Barbara mentioned before, but also um, introducing the idea of strategic empathy. I think um, we are, a lot of us are um, either not aware or we just don't do enough of empathizing with other um, people who are different. And um, that also causes a lot of, that increases the likelihood of believing in disinformation or something else. Um, and so I do, so I wanna do both of those two things and at the same time, um, sort of a complementary um, branch from education is making sure that other policymakers 
are technically savvy enough um, to understand the challenges presented by emerging technologies and not even emerging technology, something as simple as social media. Uh, we've seen how a lot of the officials are get confused when they're talking about it. Um, and because of that, regulations and all these things kind of just fly over their heads. And we end up with something that might not be the most optimal, where that is simply just not solving the problem because they don't even understand where the problems lie. So, so, so to dig on that a little bit more, and I like your recommendation very much, is that, that we may need to find the right place to solve the problem. And like you said, it may not be governments anymore because in some respects, governments are supposed to be generalist and this yeah. is a issue. So, so how would you have other institutions or maybe create other institutions to help make this happen? Um, I think one thing is to strengthen nonprofits and civil society that are already working in this space. There's, um, it's, it's highly competitive. And so they do actually compete against each other for sort of the same size of the pie in terms of funding and things like that. And rather we actually need to collaborate. The second is somehow creating um an ecosystem and i don't want to say blockchain because like that's, that's, <laughs> that's just self alerts everywhere or... <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly but like so, but somehow having a common um portal or something like that where we tell each other hey these are the initiatives that i'm working on because oftentimes we see also just a huge repetition um, of effort that honestly could have been, you know, used elsewhere oh, or fine. at least be collaborated. <laughs> Very well said. Well, thank you, Ivana. That's great. Uh, Don, are you back with us, um, or are your packet somewhere flowing somewhere else to some other country unknown? Not sure if Don is. So, Don, if you hop back in, just say you are. But I'm going to now circle to Mark. Mark, it looks like in in the absence of Don's yes. uh, Don's virtual machine going someplace else you get to have the final word on what would you do as either prime minister, president, or secretary general for the day? Don's answer was going to be so good that cyber criminals have blocked him from sharing <laughs> it with the world. We really? all know how, how smart he is. Um, well, if I were uh, king yeah. for a day or prime so minister or, or, pres <laughs> or president, what I would say is the following. My job is not to be thinking and focus just on today. My, my job is to be strategic and think about the future. And this is actually one of the areas where I think we're sorely missing, right? If we've analyzed the threat mostly as where it exists today, but putting on my futurist hat, if you look at the advances in AI and machine learning, you alluded to the deep fake problem, right? Those deep fakes are going to be so good that they'll, we won't be able to tell uh, the difference, right? And we're going and driving towards increasing augmented reality and virtual reality. So the trends are we're going to be living more of our lives in a mediated fashion as opposed to less. And that poses some serious problems. Alvin Toffler, the noted futurist from the 70s, famously said that one of the definitions of sanity is the ability to tell the real from unreal. Soon mm -hmm. we'll need a new definition. Uh, and I think that's really telling because we won't be able to tell what's fake and what's not. The other thing that I'll point out with my futurist hat is we've been talking about computers as if they're merely static devices that sit under our desk. But I want to bring us into the world of what I call 3D threats. The cyber threat, cyber risk and cyber crime is entering the third dimension through robotics. Robots are nothing more than computers that roll, fly, swim, jump and walk. And they have actuators and therefore they can hit and they can drop bombs and they can carry weapons and, you know, and, and shoot guns. And so when those get taken over, I, I see the threat going uh, to a completely new level and we're not prepared for that. So as president, prime minister and king of the universe, uh, what I would implement is, um, you know, a, a big point on education, which Ivana alluded to. Um, I think that there's a huge role for incentive competitions, right? not just picking the 10 smartest countries out of a hat at the UN, but actually creating and incentivizing prizes 
to help solve this problem. That's how Lindbergh ended up crossing the Atlantic, was an incentive competition. There are nonprofits such as the X Prize Foundation in Los Angeles that focus specifically on that. And I think that brings tremendous talent out, whether that be uh, somebody living in Kibera in the slums of Nairobi or somebody in India, who knows where that next greatest threat is going to, or, or, or idea solution is going to come from. Uh, Another big thought would be focus on cyber hygiene and epidemiology. Uh, for those of us in the field of cybersecurity, we often use the language of medicine to describe the problem. This is a computer virus. We have a computer epidemic. We talk about things like that, but we don't use the tools of medicine to help fix the problem. Epidemiology being one of them, uh, biomimicry being another, and then public health messaging being the third. So from a bio mimicry perspective, nature has been building immune systems for over a billion years. What can we learn from nature and implement that so it can respond in real times and evolve to counter some of these threats? So I think biomimicry, uh, I think we need a cyber CDC or cyber world health organizations that can help track these threats in real time and be that trusted partner that uh, Don uh, and Ivana were referring to. Uh, despite all the politicization of what's going on today, fundamentally, these are good and useful organizations. And I think public health messaging is key, right? We taught people a hundred years ago to wash their hands to avoid disease. We're now getting those messages again. We taught people not to smoke, right? Smoking is down 90% around the world. So public health messaging around cyber risk and cyber hygiene could be hugely impactful. And lastly, I think we need what I've called for in a Medium post that I wrote many years ago is a Manhattan Project for Cyber where we bring the best and brightest in the world together uh, to focus on really truly what could be an existential threat to our society and our world. And unless we're willing to commit the resources and talent at the same level of the original Manhattan Project, I think we're just going to see more of the same. So those would be the steps I would take. Wow, excellent, excellent, great ideas. And, and I would say for all panelists, uh, definitely the Atlantic Council would look forward to working with you to help promote these. Don, I see you're back. Uh, we'll see if uh, the machine will allow you to have uh, your voice. And it was interested in, now you're given the hand of Thanos and you get to be master of the universe. What would you recommend uh, in, in maybe two or three tweet length answers for world leaders to pursue? And maybe not. Well, if Don is not there, then I think we'll no. probably wrap things up. Oh, Don is there. Go yeah. ahead, Don. Yeah. Um, very quickly, to build on, on Mark's comments just a moment ago and Ivana's comments, I, I have a concept. I would get uh, a couple of other world leaders together, or maybe not. I would put maybe 10 or 20 countries' names in a bowl with on ping pong balls. I would invite somebody to come in, reach into the bowl, pull out one ball. All right, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister of that country, put together teams, five or six teams of engineers and scientists, present us with a, a report, drop those into a bucket, have somebody else come in, grab one of those and say, okay, we're gonna try this because we have to do this based on science. We have to do this based on lack of political desire and economic concerns and all that. This really is building the, the super highway for the rest of the world. And somebody has to put those guardrails up and somebody has to paint the lines in the road. So let's try and get out of each other's way and come up with a good solid method to do that for humanity. Now, are politics going to get involved? Are people going to try to steal, barter, trade, spy on? Yes, that's what humans do. So let's put some guardrails up so, and everybody can see what's going on. That's a thought. Excellent. And then actually maybe to synthesize everything that both Barbara, Don, Ivana, and Mark said, maybe what we could also consider as a way forward is we do make this truly international in nature and allow people, whether they're working in the private sector or public sector, to almost form a global reservist core focused on building those guardrails. Because you're gonna to need to bring together not just people that are hardware experts, not just software experts, not just cyber experts, but you also need people to understand what's going on in misinformation, disinformation, what's going on with the human wetware, with neurobiology. Um, and so 
uh, maybe we need to activate a truly global network to make this happen. With that, I want to thank each of you. You've all been great positive change agents, and this has been a very stimulating dialogue. Um, I liked uh, that some of you were also protecting your biometrics, um, and we really appreciate that in the live event. Um, we will we'll still neither confirm or deny that Mark is actually a uh, deep fake audio. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for everything you do as positive change agents. And tune in next time when we have further conversations about the future of trust and sense making in this challenging world. Thank you.